Welcome back everybody to the last part of the periodic table. This is part four and in tonight's video we're going to be talking about ionization energy trends and electronegativity trends. Welcome back everybody to the fourth part of the periodic table trends videos. In this last video we're going to talk about trends in ionization energy as well as electronegativity. So let's go ahead and get started with ionization energy. Ionization energy is the amount of energy required to completely remove an electron. And when we remove an electron or talk about this, we're talking about removing an electron from an atom in a gaseous state. We remove one electron and it makes a one plus ion. Sometimes you'll see us write it like this in class with a plus one. It doesn't matter which way you write it, it's fine. Um, and the energy required to remove only the first electron is called the first ionization energy. So an example here is if I have lithium, and then so we have only the one electron, to remove this first electron would be considered the first ionization energy, and then to remove another electron, the second one, it would be the second ionization energy. Here we go. The second ionization energy is the energy required to remove the second electron, and it's always greater than the first ionization energy. So let's keep this in mind. So back to our lithium, two electrons on the first shell, one on. This one, it wants to lose, remember, because it wants to have a full valence shell. But now to remove the second one, it's going to require a lot more energy because this atom of lithium doesn't want to give up this second electron. It wants to have that full valence shell. And then the third ionization energy is the energy required to remove the third electron. And again, to remove a third electron, it's greater than the first or second ionization energy. Here is an example of a table that you might see in your textbook. And even though it's a little discombobulated, the, uh, these symbols over here look a little crazy, we can see the general trend that we see have our first ionization energy, then we have the second, and the second one, like we said, is always higher than the first, so obviously this is, is higher. If we look down here, we've got 900, then the second is 2400, and then we've got 11,000 for the third one. So obviously, just like we said, it gets larger, the ionization energy, as you move down. So then we can look at some big jumps that we're seeing here, and um, I believe this they're talking about lithium and beryllium in this one. So what factors help determine what the ionization energy is going to be? So some of the clues and hopefully some of the pieces of information you picked up for so far is that the greater the nuclear charge, the greater the ionization energy. So remember, nuclear charge means number of protons. So the more protons there are, the greater the ionization energy is going to be required to remove the electron. The greater the distance from the nucleus, this will decrease the ionization energy. So the further away the electron is away from the nucleus, this will decrease the ionization energy. Filled and half-filled orbitals have lower energy, so achieving them is easier. So that will also lower your ionization energy. And then we have this thing called the shielding effect, which I think we're talking about on the next slide. So shielding, this is where an electron on the outermost energy level has to look through all the other energy levels to see the nucleus. It's not really looking through it, but this it's where this attraction is happening. So the second electron has the, second sh has the same shielding if it's in the same period. So this idea, we had talked about the Coulombic effect. So the further away this electron gets from the nucleus, um, the, more, the less ionization energy is going to be required to remove it. It's going to, meaning that this electron is going to pop off easier than, say, if it was at a closer energy level here. This will have a low IE. This one would have a higher than this, than this outside one. It'll have a higher ionization energy than this outside one because it is closer. There's a stronger Coulombic attraction. So what do we see when we look at ionization group trends? It basically is as you go down a group, the first ionization energy decreases because the electron is further away from the attraction of the nucleus and there's more shielding. So remember as you move down the group, we have our first energy shell, then we've got two shells, three shells, and so on. It gets bigger. And then what are the period trends? So there's some ups and downs to this, but all the atoms in the same period have the same energy level. 
So we see the same shielding, but increasing nuclear charge. So the ionization energy generally increases as you move from left to right. So as we move across the periodic table this way, it gets bigger because our number of protons or this nuclear charge is increasing. But remember again, we do have some exceptions to full and half full orbitals. These might be some of the exceptions that we saw when we were writing our electron configuration. Some of the ones that um, we, we had to dump one back into the d orbital or into the s orbital. Those exceptions when we wrote electron configurations, we'll see we'll also have exceptions in this ionization energy. Here is a great little chart that we should have completed in class by the time you watch this video. So we have our first ionization energy over here. Here's our atomic number. So helium has a greater ionization energy than hydrogen does. And a simple way to think about that is that helium has more protons than, than hydrogen does, so it's going to more strongly hold on to those electrons. In addition, that orbital, the helium orbital, is already full. So it says helium has a greater ionization energy than hydrogen. Both elements have the same shielding since the electrons are only in the first level, but helium has a greater nuclear charge, meaning that it has more protons. Then if we look at the next one, we have lithium. So lithium has a lower ionization energy than hydrogen because there's more shielding because that outer electron is further away and these outweigh the greater nuclear charge. So distance okay, plays a more important role, is more important than nuclear charge when we're discussing ionization energy. Then if we look at the next one, and this is a little messed up, but you can see the dot right here for beryllium. Beryllium has a higher ionization energy than lithium. It does have the same shielding, but it also now has a greater nuclear charge. Again, it means it has a greater number of protons. Then we look at boron. Boron has a lower ionization than beryllium. It has the same shielding. There's a greater nuclear charge. By removing an electron, we make the s orbital half filled. So this is one of those exceptions. So we would think it might go up, but because we're going to be making a half-filled orbital, it puts it at a lower energy. Here's carbon. Goes up. Nitrogen increases. Oxygen breaks the pattern because removing an electron leaves it with a half-filled p orbital. So hopefully you're starting to see some of those exceptions when we were looking at our Pogol packet, how sometimes it went up and then it went down. Here's fluorine, higher. And then neon, which is kind of off the chart here, has a lower ionization energy than helium. Both are full, and neon has more shielding, so it has a greater distance. So hopefully we can see the neon one right here. Sodium has a lower ionization energy than lithium. Both are in the 1s, so that means this is what their valence electron is. So it has one electron in the outer shell here. But sodium has more shielding, so it's further away. The electron in sodium is further away from the nucleus. So this greater distance means that it's going to be able to remove this electron easier. So here's an example of the whole table. So you can see it does totally go up. It spikes. And then like here with some of the exceptions, some of the exceptions. And I would contribute most of these exceptions to this idea of the half-filled orbitals being lower energy than... Um, than their counterparts. So here's some ideas about driving forces. So full energy levels require lots of energy to remove their electrons. So noble gases have full orbitals. Atoms behave in ways and try to achieve a noble gas configuration. And so what this means is I always think that they always want their outer shell to be full, but always want to gain those eight electrons. Second ionization energy. So for elements that reach a filled or half-filled orbital by removing two electrons, the second ionization energy is lower than expected. So this is true for all of the S2 orbitals. So in particular, I'm thinking about um, beryllium. I'm thinking about calcium. So alkaline earth metals form these two plus ions. The third ionization energy, so we have that same logic. So now if you're a third ionization energy, this is pretty much what your... Um, valence electrons are going to look like. So atoms have a low third ionization energy if this is your electron configuration. Atoms in the aluminum family form these three plus ions. So the second ionization energy and the third ionization energy are always higher than the first. 
but they can be lower than expected if you have this orbital or if you had the S2 orbital that we were just talking about with calcium. So trends in ionic size for cations. So cations form by losing electrons. Cations are smaller than the atom they came from because if you're losing something, you're going to be smaller. So not only do they lose electrons, but they lose an entire energy level. Metals form these cations. And cations are representative elements having noble gas configuration before them. So again, we like cations. If we're losing an electron, remember, we're going to have a positive charge. Cats, we really like cats. They're positive. And then, of course, if we're losing an electron, if one's going away, the shell, for example, for lithium, I'm going to keep coming back to this one, if I lose this outer electron, of course, now the whole atom is going to be smaller. This ion's going to be smaller. So anions form by gaining electrons, so this means that they're going to have a negative charge. And we talked about how anions, eh, we don't like it, so it's got a negative charge. Anions are bigger than an atom they came from, and that's because they're gaining electrons. So they have the same energy level, but a greater area of nuclear charge needs to cover. Nonmetals form anions, and anions of representative elements have the noble gas configuration after them. So the configuration of ions, ions, ions always have a noble gas configuration, so that means that they have an equal, a full outer shell. Uh, shell. Sodium atom is the 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1, but it forms a positive 1 ion, and so this is its shell, or sorry, this is its electron configuration, and you can see that now it has a full valence electrons, so there's 2 plus 6 is 8, and so that's what we're always going, 8 makes them happy. Um, so it's the same configuration as neon. Metals form ions with the configuration of noble gases before them. They lose electrons. Um, Nonmetals form ions by gaining electrons to achieve noble gas configuration, and they end up with a configuration of the noble gas after them. So here's just some clues. So talking about how do they get bigger, so each step down in a group is adding an energy level. Ions therefore get bigger as you go down because of the additional energy levels. Across the period from left to right, the nuclear charge increases, so they get smaller. So this is following that atomic radius pattern that we saw earlier. Notice the energy level changes between anions and cations. So here's lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, and then it gets bigger, really big, and then it gets smaller and smaller. So it is getting smaller, but then there's a breaking point, and this is where we start to gain electrons, and then it gets smaller. So we're losing electrons over here, and we're gaining them over here. The last trend that I want to discuss with you tonight is electronegativity. And the definition for electronegativity is the tendency for an atom to attract electrons to itself when it is chemically combined with another element. They share the electron, but how equally do they share it? An element with a big electronegativity means it pulls the electron towards itself strongly, meaning that it's not going to share very well with the element in which it's pulling. A good example of this is when we have hydrogen and oxygen. If we were to do a Lewis dot structure for hydrogen, we would just put hydrogen with one electron, and then if we had oxygen, it would have six electrons around it. So we'd say that oxygen is really high highly electronegative. So this one electron that is hydrogen is sharing with oxygen is going to be pulled more towards oxygen. And so this means that oxygen is highly electronegative. So it's pulling the electron towards itself. So this electron is actually going to spend more time closer to the oxygen than by the hydrogen. So the group trends that we see with electronegativity is the further down a group, the farther the electron is away from the nucleus, plus there are more electrons an atom has, thus more willing to share. So as we go down the group, we generally see that there's lower electronegativity amongst the elements. Metals are at the far left of the table. They let their electrons go easily. Thus, they have low electronegativity. They don't want to hold on to them. They want to release them, so they don't, they're not pulling other atoms' electrons, so they have a low electronegativity. 
At the right end are the nonmetals. They want more electrons, so they try to take them away from others. So these nonmetals have high electronegativity. And the one that you're going to hear us constantly talk about is oxygen. This is known as the electron hog in the chemical world. So I know that ionizing energy and electronegativity sound really similar, but remember ionizing energy is the energy required to remove an electron from an atom, where electronegativity is the atom's ability to pull an electron closer to its nucleus. But what we notice is that these actually have the similar trends. So as we go up, it increases, and as we move across the period, it also increases. And then the trends for atomic radius and ion size are also similar. So we'll notice that as we are on this side of the periodic table that the atoms are larger and that their ions are larger as well. And then down here we also notice that they're larger as we move down the group. I hope that helped explain the trends a little bit better. Please remember to see me in class if you have any questions or read your textbook, or there's also plenty of other great videos out there. Good night.